we're going to be hearing in the House on Thursday, we're going to be hearing the transportation budget. I uh, am quite concerned about what might end up happening over here in the House. We saw a strong bipartisan effort over in the Senate. Uh, I have concerns that uh, the counteroffer that is sent back to the Senate from the House is going to be highly partisan. And I don't know that that's necessarily a sign of, of good faith when you have a bipartisan effort out of one body only to counteroffer with a partisan effort on the other side. So we will see how that all works out. We'll have those hearings the end of the week. Next week, we plan on being on the floor, at least the placeholder right now is all day Tuesday of next week, and uh, likely to be looking at some of these big budget bills as we move forward. And with that, we'll get an update from Senator Schessler. Well, thank you. Uh, good to be with you again this week. Uh, you know, we're looking for a complete package in a budget to negotiate with, obviously. Uh, energy plans, uh, teacher pensions, other issues we've worked on. Uh, Senator Bailey's with us today. She has, I think, two pension bills we're going to be hearing in Ways and Means. Uh, we have some developments, of course, with uh, WSU coming up. Senator Erickson's here. Uh, he's worked really hard on our energy plan carbon reduction and, and oil train safety. So uh, we want to continue on our path of uh, the budget, transportation, and 105-day session. Then I've also brought with me Representative Wilcox and uh, Representative Manweller to answer questions that you might have for us. So with that, who would like to go first today? Mm -hmm. and whether um, you think uh, the auditor should, should step down while this investigation is ongoing? Well, sure. I, I don't think it has an impact on the budget because the auditor's budget is not a controversial or difficult part of our budget process. But I'm still very concerned about this erosion of confidence in government, trust in government by the state auditor. I still believe that a leave of absence would be a very good idea and that complete transparency with the state auditor's affairs that are being subpoenaed come forward. Uh, show, show everything, be transparent, and uh, get this over with. I think from my perspective, I look at it as it, I'm more concerned about the public perception. You've got a state <laughs> official who's responsible for the accountability of you know not only individuals but state agencies and if, if you've got that chief officer who's being questioned as to you know his integrity i think uh, standing down or stepping aside for a period of time taking a leave of absence however you want to title it in your in your headline there is probably appropriate from a from a the perception of the public out there you know while this person is going through that investigation uh, having them still running an agency like that, I think it, the public perception might be a little tough for them to uh, to swallow that. And I would agree that that maybe stepping aside for a little while might be appropriate. Does a public official have a duty to face questions and cameras and reporters? My advice would be step out of your office and tell everything you know and when you knew it of any office that transparency and trust is important, it's our state auditor. Come out of the office. And I think historically, you know, there have been there have been a few situations where other you know officials have been you know questioned on ethics re issues or whatever it may be. And I think it is appropriate for them to, at least within, if there if there's a if there's a lawsuit and there's reasons why they can't talk about certain things, I understand that. But is it, as the sitting official, I think it's their responsibility to ask questions, or excuse me, anything, answer those questions. Is there anything the legislature can do at any point? Like if more um, information comes out, uh, right now, I mean, still, there's a lot of questions that remain about the investigation, but if more information comes out, is there any any kind of action that the legislature can take if, um, if you deem it? Well, the best tools are federal. The grand jury process, the Department of Justice are very powerful tools to get to the truth that we don't have. I think it's premature for us to consider uh, subpoenas from any branch of legislature when you have an ongoing investigation by the federal government. Just for how many members of the public have contacted each of your offices or you directly and expressed a concern? 
Me personally, very, very few at this point. Right. Very few at this point. Uh, and I think a lot of it has to do with it's kind of, it's, it is new. People are just learning about it. And, uh, but now that being said, I think it, based on outcomes of investigations, that those numbers obviously might increase and, you know, or decrease for that matter. Uh, but at this point, very, very few. You no, know, it's, it's been very, very few contacts. Many are, are in person that people have asked me while I was home this past weekend, for example. But I think the public is pretty savvy. This is the Department of Justice, federal and not state, but they are troubled about their elected auditor's credibility. You say it's premature to consider subpoenas. What, what would be the trigger? I don't know what that trigger might be, but you know, I think we have to let uh, the Department of Justice, the IRS, and a grand jury do their job. Clearly, they have tools to do it with, and we should uh, not do anything that would impede their investigation. And I don't think until we have more facts on this that it's our job at this stage of the game to jump to conclusions. I mean, we still have, you know, innocent until proven guilty. None of that's been expressed by any of the investigations going on at this point that I've seen anyway. And so we're going we're gonna to stand down until we may have to stand up. Can both of you say, without a doubt, any of your members already contemplating running for that office or seeking the appointment? Have you had conversations with members or...? First, you have, a, have to have a vacancy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, there's, you know, no, I haven't had any conversation with a member about it. Uh, I think there's some people who regret the 2012 election didn't turn out differently now. I haven't gotten a call from the governor's office yet asking me. So. <laughs> 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 Would you like to talk to them? It's just a big distraction right now yeah, from the work that we're trying to do here in the legislature. So well, I, yeah. we need to begin to focus more on our work. Yeah. Who else? <clears throat> Hopefully a different I subject. Actually, <laughs> um, it looks like you have one that would garnish wages to help pay for incarceration costs of people that might have right. um, committed offenses while well on the job as a public employee. Um, also, another one that looks like it would just take away pension. It would benefits. Pension. Can you yeah. tell me about what prompted those and why um, you have introduced that legislation? Well, actually, it's the media that actually brought it to my attention uh, some time ago. And uh, with that in mind and going and doing a little investigative work on my own part, it became clear that we really needed to go and look at this situation um, and really try to take some action. I think the general public would expect that of us. Uh, it's, it doesn't sit well with the public nor with, I think, legislators that we have people incarcerated for egregious crimes against children and uh, still drawing a pension. So uh, we're going to look at those today. Uh, the garnishment would, like you say, allow for uh, their pension to be garnished in a way to pay their expenses of incarceration. Uh, notwithstanding the fact, though, they may have dependents, they may have, you know, a spouse, and we certainly want to protect them, but um, I think it's reasonable. Um, I've been told that the bill has some merit and probably can uh, get through the process. Are you thinking of teachers in particular with this legislation? Though? Actually, anyone. It's not just teachers. Mm -hmm. Anyone on a state pension system. You know, I think it's entirely appropriate. Senator Bailey is the chair of the Pension Policy Committee, and this didn't come up during that meeting schedule, but the chairman of Pension Policy, who serves on Ways and Means, is the natural expert to lead this for us. What about the other bills that are Senator Braun's just Senator Schessler, can you speak to those? Senator Braun has some bills dealing with pensions that would, oh my gosh, that would set um, the, the salary for, for calculation of, of pension benefits at the average wage and also maybe push out the retirement age for a lot of employees. Is that, are those priority bills for your caucus at this point? I can't say that they're priorities, but I think they're ideas worth exploring. Uh, the problem is we have to be very wary of pension costs for future generations. Very important that we keep that system solvent. The other thing is when we go to retire, uh, some of our hardest working, lower paid state employees, pensions aren't as good. And some 
can pad it at the end of their career with very high pensions. And I think uh, Senator Braun and before him Senator Tom have looked at ways that we might consider reforms to keep our system healthy uh, in perpetuity, really. It's a very complex system. You know, we have more than one pension uh, uh, system. So when we begin to look at one, then we have to take into account what happens in the others. Uh, we have old, old pension systems with the left systems that affect various individuals. And then we have the state, you know, uh, public employees system. So, and they all function a little differently. It's really important that whatever we do, we get it right for um, the entire system. Uh, and, and looking at how we would uh, would do something like that, it would take a new pension system coming into effect. It's going to be very difficult to adjust those that w that already exist, and uh, that that would be a real high bar. Something that we haven't really studied, uh, but it certainly brings up some good uh, opportunities to look more proactively at the way we do our pension system. Right now, we're still um, concerned about maintaining as. Senator, Senator Schessler said the integrity of the system. Uh, we still have some unfunded liability in our pension system, and we're uh, working to make sure that those uh, all stay very solvent and well funded. Who else? Uh, Representative yes. So, um, a Senate committee heard uh, House Bill 1836 this morning on the drought preparedness. Well, on the drop preparedness issue, there's a there's an internal debate also going on with respect to how much money is going to really solve the problem. And oftentimes, you're going to see bills come out either the House or the Senate if they're not coming out unanimously, and there's a lot of no votes on it. Typically, that means that there's some questions or some discuss continued discussion that needs to take place. Obviously, we're looking at you know driest, warmest. <laughs> Um, you know, winter, uh, you know, that we've seen in a long, long time here. There's a lot of concerns as to what kind of drought preparedness that we're going to truly need. We did see a similar situation. I want to say it was about 2005 or 6 ish. There was another drought that we went through. And what we did back in, in what we, historically we've done is we've had, you may, have, you may recall, there's been some flood preparedness money that we've set aside. And we actually ended up moving flood money to drought preparedness. And so you had an account where the money was going back and forth depending on what the weather cycle was for that particular you know, budget cycle that we're dealing with. And so when we send that bill over there, it's to have more of an open discussion on, is this really enough or not? Uh, it was also something that came up kind of late in session. Uh, I think everybody was kind of hoping we were going to see some, some late snowfalls. And as that obviously was not taking place, it was something that we kind of had to get through the system quickly. If I could follow up on that, I represent Kittitas yeah. County, and we have almost no snowpack this year. Um, we're estimating about 70% of our water before we get curtailment. So we obviously appreciated the governor's efforts to make drought an issue. I think the concerns with the bill was the way it, and some of the money was being spent. And a drought is an immediate problem that requires an immediate solution. But some 30 to 35% of the funds available were going to go to like fish passages. And I have nothing against fish passages. Uh, they're an effective part of overall uh, mitigation of water problems, but it's not an immediate solution to an immediate problem. So I think there was some concerns that we needed to spend that money in a way that immediately relieved the drought rather than maybe a longer term approach. Not that we're against a longer term approach, but the drought relief needs to be in the short run. And on the drought issue, quickly, if I may also, we had a hearing on that today, a joint hearing in the Senate. And one of the key aspects we need to emphasize is that snowpack is strong in British Columbia, Idaho, and Montana. And so for our energy producing dams on the Columbia River, snowpack is good and our water quantities there are looking good going forward in the summer also. So it's much more Olympic Peninsula, more localized in the Cascade, but good snowpack in Canada, Montana, Idaho, which is good news for energy rates going forward in Washington. And Senator, remind me of the time frame. Do you have to wait until the House passes their budget before you release yours? Or what's the, what's the thought process right now on your package? Well, by tradition, uh, that's the case. Uh, I hope we don't have to break with tradition because there w isn't one coming. We just hope that uh, we're dealing with a complete budget without any <coughs> phantom resources that we can seriously have a conversation. Do you expect that the Senate budget will come out next week then? 
Well, I think we're, we're well positioned to follow shortly with the budget. Uh, our people have been working hard and effectively. I think the House budget is coming out Friday. Uh, how, many, how long will it be? Assume, whether it comes out Friday or Monday or whatever, but how soon after the House budget comes out would your site be able to produce its budget? Well, I think we're, we're well positioned to follow up promptly. Uh, promptly we've been meaning one week, two weeks, one day? Well, I, I, two weeks would be a bet. I mean, we want to, we're very, very close to being able to go forward. Uh, we hope that they come forward with a good product. I think uh, one of the questions that we all have is uh, <coughs> what kind of a budget is it? Uh, if you remember a couple years ago, uh, Ross Hunter responded to the governor's first budget by calling it a budget thingy. That was uh, Ross's word. And, uh, you know, we, we feel that a budget uh, is not just a spending document. It also lays out what are the resources, and if it requires additional taxes, they have to have the bills. We have to hear the bills and vote on the bills before it's a real budget. And uh, that, I think, is the biggest mystery over here right now. Are they going to provide those trailer bills? Well, I think for the Senate, they need to have, if they're, what's, what's going to happen is the Senate then puts them in a position of negotiating, and if they don't have a full document from the House side, it makes it very, very difficult for them to even start the negotiation process when you're dealing with a, as you said, or Ross Hunter's had a budget thingy. You know, it's, it, it's, if it's not complete, how do you negotiate something that's not complete? Isn't that always the case? I mean, I can remember last time when we had a long extended mm -hmm. budget process, I feel like some of those exemption bills were done at the very so isn't that just sort of the reality of how this thing goes? At the very last minute two years ago in 2013, there were expenditures and but new revenue that were also done at the same time. And so those were part of the negotiations. While the initial budget that went out was, was as I recall, the funding sources were there. But the, yeah, that was complete. It was the final negotiations to get both sides or all four corners to come up with what ultimately ended up being the largest yes vote in 25 years. It was the new revenue, new reforms, and new expenditures that were going to take place. Those were the negotiated parts of the budget that we ended up dealing with in the latter days of session. And the major tax bills were fully debated, yes. uh, passed out of uh, uh, finance and across the House floor, uh, because that's what it takes to negotiate. Do you have the votes? Well, that has not not happened yet. I mean, I guess I'm wondering, are you guys concerned about the progress on the House budget at this point and it not being passed out? Andy Hill had a policy brief saying he was hoping it would be passed by Monday, which has clearly not happened. So uh, what are the concerns that are driving your concerns about the tax bills not being there? When there's no how, do you how do you negotiate with something that doesn't exist? I mean, if you base spending levels on <laughs> bills that don't exist, how do you negotiate it? Okay, but isn't that, isn't this sort of a pot calling the kettle black thing because the Democrats are using the exact same argument? against you on transportation? No, that's not true, John. Uh, on transportation. Yes, it is. Your son could not pass a transportation bill for 23 months. Uh, but when we did, it was bipartisan and a record number of Republicans supporting it. 20 Republicans supported it, seven Democrats. Compared to that, what happened in the House, a 50-48 vote, completely different packages, different results. I think some of those Democrats voted. You know, we could. I don't think there's. I don't think there's a whole lot of problems since forty some members voted for the spending that they would vote for the bonds. So why is it clearly, because uh, we're not done yet. But I mean, clearly, if you vote, if you vote for a spending package of goodies with forty odd votes, and you only need thirty plus, you have plenty of votes for the bonds if you bring it up, because it would be very inconsistent to vote for billions in spending and then not vote for the bonds to pay for it, that's very inconsistent. Well, then a historical lesson, too, is in 2005 and 2003, it was a similar situation. The bonds was the last part of the package, regardless of which side it came out from. And there was a one-vote majority in the Senate in 2003 compared to a 46 to 52 vote in the House. And then in 2005, you know, we had a similar situation where all the lists, all the packages, and everything were all decided upon first by both sides, and then the bond vote was run last. I just seem to remember this being an argument in the Senate. I can't remember if it was last year or two years ago when the House passed their transportation package. Mm -hmm. Over here, I heard often that they didn't pass the bond. Sure. Well, let's. So I guess I'm wondering how 
Yeah. Okay, here's a, compa here's a comparison, Rachel. Uh, if you can only get 50 members to vote for the, for the revenue right. and the package, how are you ever going to get to 60 something for bonds? Mm -hmm. right. If you can't support the revenue and you can't support the package, how would you ever, why would you ever vote for the bonds? Now we had over 40 votes, I believe, for our package in the I Senate. Think we had 27. No, but we had 27 for revenue, but we had a bunch of people that also wanted to vote for the projects. Mostly Democrats that voted for the package, but not the revenue. So if everybody that votes for the projects votes for the bonds, you have more than enough, which was clearly different than the House. Well, everybody knows the tough vote is the tax vote, and they mm -hmm. took the tough vote in the Senate. We had proportionally a lot more votes and a lot more bipartisan than the House package was. Let me throw a scenario at you, or about two, one or two scenarios at you. Okay, assume the D's, the House D's come out with a budget on Friday, and the budget says <coughs> we're going to spend X now, we spend all this, and so on. And Ross Hunter says we're going to and I'm just making this up off the top of my head to say we're going to have a capital gains tax and a carbon emissions tax and so on. Um, but it does not have a specific bill in that package. Is that going to stop your side from negotiating? And the other scenario I wanted to throw at you is do you have to have the House pass to say it? Again, you had a carbon tax or a capital gains tax and had a bill, but they don't vote on passing it or send it to committees immediately. Does that stop your spike from negotiating? Well, it makes it very hard to take it serious, <clears throat> and it makes it very hard to negotiate with that level of spending when there's no real dollars behind it. Okay, so if he does not have, so if he does not have a specific Bill HB 1000 ready to install a tax. All right, is your side going to say, don't call us until you have that in the past? Well, it's pretty hard to take that portion of the spending serious. And I, I hardly believe you can take something serious that's theoretical. Of course, the whole budget is at this point, since the census hasn't been introduced yet. So I guess my question is, why are you so concerned about that? I mean, have you heard that they're not going to have tax bills associated with it? Well, it's, it's easier to spend the money than to pay for it, and they clearly um, just need to pay for it. I, I'm sorry, can I interject for a quick second here? And, and this is where I'm coming from. Now, I might not be in the majority in the Senate you know, to respond, but at the end of the day, we were still, and we've talked about this since day one, to get this job done in 105 days, you've got to take seriously all the aspects necessary to get this thing done. And if you're going to play games with just putting out a budget and not showing how you're going to fund it, you're not taking seriously, first of all, the 105-day statutory limit that we were given to get the job done in the first place. Last year was the first time in six years we got out of here on time. We're tired of that. Stop coming up with excuses. Let's get, and, I, and I'm saying this for all four corners. If we were in the majority, them in the majority, any of us in the majority, let's take our responsibilities seriously here. There really truly is no reason why we have to continue year after year after year to go into one, two, three special sessions to get the job done. You know, I've not seen in my 13 years here the votes change between April and June. The vote's the same. And so why, why, let's just get, let's get this over with and let's not, let's not, you know, cost the taxpayers more money by the day, $20,000 or whatever the number is per day to stall because we aren't doing our job down here. And so it's holding all of us accountable, frankly, is what this, this discussion would be. And I hope that you would reflect to the public that, look, we told them 105 days. What's their excuse for not getting it done in 105 days? Regardless of who it is, hold us accountable for that. Let me put one of the scenarios. Uh, does your site have any revenue bills coming out of in your upcoming budget, are you going to have any revenue bills or money raising bills or whatever in order to get your package? We've, we've always said we could do this without new taxes. And I still believe we can do it without taxes, John. We got $3 billion in new, in new money that the taxpayers have given us. That is, we should be able to get the job done with that. And then since day one, we've said that would be an absolute last resort, and we're not there yet. Okay, so Thank you. Essentially, you're saying your side, you don't have to sweat for that. 
that be a thing as the state has to keep that? You know, I, I said, we said Andy Hill can do it without new taxes, and I stand by that. Thank you.